Zen at the Sharp End. Welcome to the podcast about how to turn difficult people and relationships into your best teachers. I'm Mark West Maquette, a Zen Buddhist teacher, mindfulness teacher, and ex professional astronomer. This is a podcast to go along with my book, Zen and the Art of Dealing with Difficult People. In each episode, we'll be exploring different varieties of people, relationships, and situations that we find irritating, difficult, or painful. Together with a number of Zen friends, I'll be discussing how the practices of Buddhism and mindfulness can help us see our difficult people as troublesome Buddhas, our greatest teachers. This podcast is sponsored by Zen Minded. If you get a chance, check them out at www.zenminded.uk. You'll find a curated selection of Japanese homeware and incense, a perfect match to your meditation practice. We're also sponsored by BetterHelp. BetterHelp offers convenient and affordable therapy online. In my opinion, meditation and psychotherapy both offer valuable avenues for exploring our suffering, habits and stuck areas. A while back I spent three and a half years meeting twice a week with a psychotherapist when things had become acute, And it felt like the help he gave me was really transformational, especially when supported by my regular meditation practice. If you're interested, they've extended an offer of 10% off your first month of therapy at betterhelp.com slash zen at the sharp end. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash zen at the sharp end. In this episode, I'm speaking with Rohinya Haralaw. South African-born and with Indian heritage, Rohingya is an engaged Buddhist, racial activist, psychologist and management consultant. In this episode, she discusses the difficult issue of creating and using labels and identity, when Buddhist practice asks us to let these go. She talks about how encounters with challenging people can become catalysts for examining the storylines we hold about ourselves and the situation in general, but cautions that real transformation always comes with a level of discomfort, which we need to be ready to face. She emphasises that dealing with difficult people is not about retaliation, as in an eye for an eye, or about passivity, but about realising the interdependent nature of the universe, and acting from that broad perspective. Uh, so hi, Rahina. Uh, I'm so glad you could join us today on the podcast. I, I've been really interested to talk to you. I mean, um, uh, yeah, so welcome. Welcome on the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. It's really lovely mm. to be here. It's been a little bit of a journey to get here, hasn't it? <laughs> yeah, we've had to reschedule a bit and things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I wonder if perhaps you could just start us off then and talk a little bit about um, your background in Buddhist practice and you know where you're coming from. Yes. So I think I'm going to locate this slightly in a different context, um, because I think my Buddhist journey cannot be separated from my racial identity and the journey that I come from and the country mm. that I come from. So so it's also linked, I guess, to my, my heritage. So just thinking about it, um, I'm actually... We, 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 our podcast, this podcast is based in the United Kingdom, but I'm actually South African mm-hmm. and, um, and South African. My heritage is that of indentured labor, which was a group of people that were brought over from India post enslavement on the very same ships that took, um, enslaved people from Africa to the U.S. to grow sugarcane around the world or to or what was mm-hmm. a replacement labor um, called indent- indentured labor. So my ancestry comes from that. And my ancestors come from Bodhgaya. And Bodhgaya is the place where the Buddha achieved enlightenment. Wow. What, what a connection. So, <laughs> yes. So, so, so for me, that's my heritage coming from, you know, the north of India, Bihar, all the way down to India from Mumbai ancestors. um, And, you know, I have ancestors who've been enslaved as well through my US um, connection and, 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 and heritage. Um, And so, so, you know, so that's the heritage for me from an Asian or South Asian perspective. Um, And then I guess from, 
from South Africa, um, South Africa, as you know, um, growing up in a very racially divided society, I grew up in the heart of the apartheid movement. And so racial segregation um, was rife. We all lived in separate areas. Um, but all the people who were classified as Indian, and I'm actually dual heritage, I, I'm both African and I'm Indian. Um, so yeah were put in Indian areas and there you lived with those who practiced Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, different types of Jainism, whatever. And so yeah. everyone got exposed to everyone else's practices. So my family have always been from that sense, being Buddhist in, you know, in, in their practice. Um, but my father actually, who was very involved in, 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 in racial activism in South Africa. He built one of the first temples in, in the area that I grew up in, which was KwaZulu-Natal, which mm -hmm. housed all that every single religious identity could use the space to practice in. So irrespective of whether you were Muslim or Hindu or Buddhist or Jain, you had a special space to display whatever you needed, but you could all use this. So there was a very much, from his perspective, something around uniting across mm. traditions, religious traditions, etc. So I think for me, um, Buddhism, in a way, if, if one thinks of Buddhism in terms of that, um, I, and in terms of the practice of what my parents did in terms of activism, in terms of taking care of others, their practice has always been Buddhist. So I like to call myself, I practice Buddhism rather than I am Buddhist. Yep. Because I yep. feel that when we label an identity, we have this tendency to cling onto it and sure. to it some value to it as being better or less than something else. Yeah. So, so that was where my um, exposure... But, and and es essentially, all of our practice is one of disidentifying from different things. I mean, that's the whole point of our Buddhist practice, really. So if you, I agree, if you say, I am a Buddhist, you're basically identifying with it. You're getting right. stuck in it. Yeah. Mm. Yes. And, and it's also, you know, the same when we label ourselves from any perspective. So maybe there is a time where we have to deep, dig deeply into what each of that identity means, you know, the intersectionality of all our identities to do the healing. And, and when we really look at it, that's when you can free yourself from that label that we have. And for me, that is the Buddhist practice of one, emptiness, or empty of a separate self, or empty of a separate label. Um, and the second is is around um, healing, you know, healing from that uh, uh, clinging to that identity. Mm -hmm. so, so, so for me, you know, being involved in activism from, from very young, 12 was when, you know, we were classified as terrorists and all of that. That was when I actually left Buddhist practice because I did not see Buddhism as offering a way forward in that racially very divided society where we lived in a state of emergency, were constantly harassed, you know, all of the dynamics of being in a very divided, racially oppressed uh, society, which is not so long ago, 20, 25 years ago. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you know, so that was for me, I think, um, both a distancing away from Buddhism in that way, because it wasn't answering a social need that I had in terms of what was going on in terms of justice and a pure labeling of that as, you know, that's karma does not, did not make sense to me. Um, mm. So, mm. so there was a distancing from it. And then, you know, as South Africa went through its turbulent history, um, I was exposed to quite a lot of people like Desmond Tutu and uh, Nelson Mandela. And you could see, even though they weren't practicing Buddhists, there is an essence of Buddhist elements that, you know, or actually, and maybe it applies across the different all religions. That, that kind you, of universal, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, that universal sort of the peace, the calmness, the love, the yeah. caring for others, standing up for justice, but at the same time trying not to harm other people. Um, and so, you know, so post-apartheid, I got quite involved in the, in the um, truth and reconciliation and all the 
pro programs and activities around, you know, addressing what, you know, addressing the divisions in our society uh, in South Africa. And then as a result of that, I came to the UK um, for the work that I did there and was really interesting because it was here when I came to the UK that I really started looking back into and going back into or returning, I would say, into Buddhism. And mm. that was through my exposure of Thich Nhat Hanh, um, mm. because Thich Nhat Hanh for me is such a clear example of how one engages in Buddhism, how yeah. one takes the essence of Buddhism and practices it mm. in an engaged fashion. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, and clearly that resonated for me coming from the turbulent history of South Africa, the violence and, you know, his experience of Vietnam, all of that, being in exile, all of that was very much resonant to my own story. So it yeah. was then that I started again, 1998, started immersing myself into Buddhism again um, mm. in the Thich Nhat Hanh tradition. So and, and Thich Nhat Hanh, were you aware of him when you were growing up or that was, he know, was someone who, who came on your radar only when you got to the UK? You know, it was really funny um, because um, I remember when I was 16, um, I actually wanted to become a monastic. I wanted to mm. become, you know, become a, a monk or monastic, a nun in this case, not a monk. Um, so, um, but there was no one that, because my parents were not around, there was no one that would give me permission. So at that time, for some reason, I was doing a lot of mood boards and I came across Thich Nhat Hanh's writing and I put his picture on a mood board somewhere saying, mm, that's an aspiration. Maybe one day I will meet you. And so yeah. it was almost, you know, 20 years later, well, 10, 10, 15 years later that he came into my radar in 1998. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, so it's quite, you know, it's, yeah. Anyway, so that's when I started practicing in the in the Plum Village or Thich Nhat Hanh tradition. Mm. Uh, but mm. also explored quite a lot of inside tradition. And for me, I practice in the inside tradition. I practice in the Thich Nhat Hanh tradition. I am a order member in the Thich Nhat Hanh tradition. Yeah. And now I'm studying very much in the Tibetan tradition as well. Right. Uh, because yeah. of, because I really want to deepen my understanding of the Buddhist scripts and texts and, and really try to understand that. And mm. so it's really interesting because I work in a in a very cutthroat um, business environment and you know right. I, I work as a management consultant. And so for me, practicing some of those Buddhism in this context becomes both challenging, but also an opportunity to really examine some of those um, theoret the concepts that we think, you know, that that theoretically we seem to understand so well, but need to to embody them through practice. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I mean, wow, that's that's quite some uh, arena, you know, like the, the the business world of management consultancy in itself is itself uh, quite an arena for all sorts of difficulty and challenges of how to put into practice what what we learn and then and then also the, the engaged uh practices which you which you have otherwise you know in the different groups and uh, uh and the writings and things like that how how do we put into practice all these things that we understand how do we actually you know embody this stuff Yes, I agree. I think, and that's why I think I believe quite strongly that the way, and I think Thich Nhat Hanh says this, the way out is the way in. And, mm. you know, as much as we may wish to engage in the world, um, that engagement is driven from, a, if it's driven from a reaction that, you know, is built on harm and continues to call, cause harm, then there is no real difference between what you're trying to redress and your own energy that you're creating in redressing mm. that. So for mm. me, I think that's, you know, for me, that's important, um, doing that, that inner work so that we can act in the world um, with some semblance, as far as we can anyway, with some semblance of, holding on to the practice that we, 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 you know, we adopting. And so as for best me, we can. Yeah. yes, as best yeah. we can. And that's really, that's really important because that 
means that how do we make that real and alive in a business world? How do we make it real and alive in an activism world? Because they both um, not only label one and in one being labeled in a, in a particular way, they in a way define or set some expectations of what that behavior or uh, that role will be. Um, and then, you know, and then it's how do you hold on to this intention of not creating harm, of having care and compassion when you're in an activist situation, which often can be very volatile, very mm. uh, activating and sometimes built to built and reactions can be really angry. Mm. Mm. Absolutely. That's right. Yeah. 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 So, okay. So in all of that, um, I, I'm interested to know at what point do you think the, the idea that difficult situations and difficult people, which most people would kind of like move away from or try to distance themselves from or try to avoid uh, are actually places where we can learn a lot about ourselves, you know, as a sort of uh, a practice in itself. Do, can you kind of, cast your mind back and, and maybe get a sense of when that might have arisen within you as a as a um potential mm, i think probably and and i'm going to relate this back to my activism and do a little bit of a comparison mm. uh, when i was in south africa i was anger anger that uh whether it was righteous anger or anger of being treated as a secondary citizen, of being oppressed, um, you know, the quest for justice of, you know, all of that was driven by anger. And yeah. I would say that activism, and so that anger also kept me alive because being engaged in, you know, in that level of activism and resistance where you would be arrested where where you had to watch who was following you in case you were arrested where all of those kinds of things in almost like a police state um kept me hyper vigilant you know when you sat in a room you knew you had already looked through the room and identified what your exits were and yeah. you would sit in the room with your back to the wall and you know yeah. looking and you know so that hyper vigilance is was always latent you know and and that came from anger you know that so much anger in in that and i think it's only when i re-immersed myself into buddhism that i started noticing that actually in the reaction and often when we are in difficult situations, we, 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 we react. We want to take this highly difficult thing as if it's an explosion and hurl it away from us. So mm, we want to take right. the anger and we want to throw it away or we want to walk away. So we have some kind of fight or flee or freeze response to, to it. But the reality of it is all of those, firstly, all those emotions, and as I started realizing it you know all of those emotions everyone goes through it everyone gets angry everyone reacts to anger everyone feels sadness everyone feels happiness those are not individual um, feelings and characteristics those are things that we all mm. you know we all go through but the triggers that or the things or the, the activations of some of those or what activates them is different for us all based on our history, on our mm. social context and the stories in a way that we've created or has been created for us. That's that right. either yeah, yeah. brings us or does not. And so I think as I started sitting more and initially sitting more, it was a realization actually that transformation comes with discomfort everything that grows or changes with, with discomfort you said discomfort yes discomfort yeah. has a degree mm -hmm. of discomfort if you mm -hmm. exercise and when you exercise really hard to for your muscles to grow there is discomfort there's a little bit of mm -hmm. pain before it right. actually grows you know you get stronger not through ease but through some slight discomfort if you want to run yeah. you get breathless and so yeah. so for me that sign of people um or challenging people or situations is a good 
place to start examining my own stories that I told myself about them or the stories that have created that situation for my reaction. Mm. So examining that and airing it because sometimes there's pain in it, sometimes which needs to be healed. Because if we do what we've always done, we'll get what we always get. You know, we yeah. if I if I'm if I'm trying to change the society towards becoming more just and equitable. But if I exercise the anger and injustice and the way the behaviors that have been meted out in trying to oppress me by me to try and change the situation, am I not just replicating what has been done to me? Mm, mm. So, you know, hurt well, people hurt. So I, I just that just what you said there, I think needs a. Uh, saying again, I think it's a it's a difficult. Uh, it's, it's very powerful what you're saying there about how um, if we react with the same actions that have been given to us that have created this situation that we're not happy with, then are you say are we not just basically just continuing the cycle? Is that is that what you're saying? I think what I'm saying is that you know. If I am oppressed and if I react with the same energy of trying to mm. oppress someone else because they've oppressed me. So yes. let, me, let me use a race example. You know, I've been oppressed um, in South Africa and it's been racially unjust. And, you know, so when I experience racial discrimination, do I, am I not, you know, when someone is, you know, there is some pain and there's some suffering and there's a whole lot of reasons as to why people is, you know, behaving in the way they have. But if I actually react in the same way, it just escalates. If someone mm. hits me on my, you know, I think the Dalai Lama said it, if someone, you know, um, if someone blind, you know, if someone blinds you, what is the, what is the Christian phrase? If, uh, that's, I thought it was Gandhi. Gandhi said, if, if you take an eye for an eye, then the whole world will be blind. Yeah, it was either Gandhi or Dalai Lama, but maybe they've quoted Something one. Like that. But yeah, if, yeah, if it's yeah. an eye for an eye, then the whole world will end up being blind. And is that not the same yeah. thing? I mean, if yeah. we look at the situation of Israel and Palestine, you know, it's almost a case of people who have been really um, harmed and hurt. We usually expect that they would see how that oppression plays out in their own in their own lives and in their own behaviors, but that doesn't actually happen. It takes a degree mm. of reflection and insight to be able to examine that and to see it not as a permanent characteristics of yourself, but as something that one can change. So for mm. me, I think it's, it's not it's not it's not not challenge. It's not passivity. It's not being passive in the sense of if someone is slapping me, I turn around and say, "Here's my other cheek, slap me again," or I become yeah. passive and silent. It's the place in which from which you respond that's different. So it's not mm. responding from a place of, of anger because that just escalates, but actually seeing and trying to understand what is going on. And it doesn't mean you could do it immediately. It may mean that you have to walk away to reflect on it. But well, it's so that's it. So here's, so here's a question. So, how, so let's say someone um, acts on you in a way that you don't like. And you have this sense of anger arising. And then how do we get from that place to this other place that you're talking about where we are able to react from a, a, a place of like awareness? And how I do think, we get there? Yes, I think we get there from doing our inner work. And I think mm. it comes back to what everyone is now fond of calling mindfulness, which mm. we think, you know, being able to to give yourself that one second that enables you to discern and pause to hold that reaction. You know, I can see, you know, and that that's what mindfulness does. You start mm. observing what's happening to your mind, what's happening to your body, and you have that one, and all it takes is po potentially one second that gives you the opportunity to say, am I, am I not? What am I going to do? I can see yeah. this. What am I going to do? And you right. may choose to act with anger, but then that's a conscious decision. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So, so then a follow on question, like you say, maybe you choose to act out of that anger. So, so could you talk a little bit about anger? I think anger, you know, it's, it's a really interesting emotion in that it can, maybe you mentioned the word righteous anger earlier on, and then like, 
hot headed and maybe cold anger. You know, what, how, how does anger, how do we work with anger when it arises? Uh, I think it's difficult. I think the first thing is being aware that you are actually angry. Mm. And a lot of us, when we are angry, I think the Buddha gave a story as when we, you know, when we have strong emotions, sometimes um, the emotions, um, rather than us riding the emotions, it's like a wild horse that's gone rampant. And rather than us controlling the horse, the horse just runs rampant um, mm. with the rider not being able to control us. And anger is the same. And, you know, I think it's really through, yeah, so it's almost like, for me, anger tells me something is going wrong. And, and what is going wrong? You know, what is this that's going on? Why am I feeling this way? And so, you know, we may say that this anger is justifiable. You know, if someone has burnt my house down, I could be really righteous and say, well, my anger is righteous. I've got to go back and burn their house down because mm. they burnt my house down, you know, an eye for an eye. Yeah. But is that really righteous anger? Or is there... You know, is there a way that we can respond um, which still achieves the outcome we want to raise the issue, to handle it, but in a different way? Mm. And I think mm. that's that's where we all, um, I, I think, for me, that's where I want to move to, is how do I actually handle matters of social justice, um, racism in particular, without perpetuating the type of energy that has been created for me. Now, and for me, that comes all the way back to for me to look at my intention. When I am angry, right. it's, it's telling me something's going wrong. And, you know, I need to do something about it. And I need to understand why do I feel that way? Is mm. it, you know, is it, Yes, I can see, yes, someone's gaslighting me. Yeah, I can see this is really racist. But what do, you know, but do, but I, I also want to understand, you know, there's right. a reason why they be, you know. And so yeah. for me, that space gives me an opportunity to think about what my response is going to be and whether it's worth responding. Mm. If there's someone who, you know, what, what, what is my intention? Am I trying to change their mind? Um, and if so, if someone who is rampantly racist, no matter what I say, is not going to change their mind, is it really, is it really going to help me to do that? And and it's interesting what you say about that, being able to look past uh, the a superficial action to see this person and they they have their own history and their own stories and their own ways of seeing the world which have come from their background and their ancestry and all that kind of stuff and and if we can step into that perspective then that changes everything right i think it may not change everything it gives us a level of insight and understanding and you can see you know i guess what that is and therefore gauge your response accordingly because mm. we all, like we all have our stories we all come you know and those stories we are not independent uh, unitary self-existing people we are a combination of compounded factors you know mm. there are causes and conditions no one even trump can turn around and say i have achieved everything on my own right. no no one That's feeds right. you someone clothes you someone does everything yeah. um you know you, you, we are interdependent so we've got to look at someone who who is a consequence of their society, of the way they've been brought up, and then their story, and all of those things. And I think an exercise, a sense of compassion as well, right? Mm -hmm. I can hear, I can see that you're saying all these things from this reason. Ultimately, you're, you're a human being. You have good qualities, and you have some not so good qualities, like me. So can I see you as a human being in the first instance? We, mm. You know, and then choose a response. That's and is bad. my response kind? Um, mm. And I think for me, that's that in my own activism has made a huge difference in that I no longer feel like I need to rage and burn things down. I want yeah. to be more constructive. I'm able to, you know, because actually when we rage and want to burn things down, there's also an element of ego involved in that, yeah. which means, you know, 
I, you know, when I have, I notice for myself, and, you know, I could only talk about myself, when I'm having despair, when, you know, now in, in, in what's happening with the e- e- ecological crisis, when I feel like there's despair, no matter what we do, nothing seems to be tractioning in the right way. Mm. There's a real Alva identification of me. It feels like it's, it's not happening. I am the one that should be making a yeah. difference. An over-identification of ego that Mm. makes me despair because I feel if I'm doing all of this, there should be a shift change. But the reality Mm. of it is I'm one minute part in a whole system. I can do my bit in this system. And maybe that little bit adds to a little drop into something else and to something else, right? Mm. So I think it's looking at, for me that's looking at it in that way. That's and so maybe interesting. That, that sort of aspect of the ego coming involved and, and identifying that the ego is there um, maybe reminds me of this, um, what what we tend to often do is to kind of wallow in in feeling, isn't it? Like, like I feel terrible. Ah, isn't it been a terrible day? And I tell everyone about it and I really, really, you know, hang my head and feel, and there's a kind of sense of, almost like enjoying kind of like being in that place because because in a way we kind of like identify with it and 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 it's very much coming from this ego place comes from an ego place but it's also you we make it you know if you think about it minute by minute even your anger has a different texture and flavor Mm. your pain Mm. has a different texture and a flavor i don't mean a flavor in in terms of that but a nuance and so i think we tend to think that you know and and we apply this not just to ourselves but also to others as if this fleeting quality you know whole lots of actions and reactions and changes in my physiological body that's associated with anger is permanent. It's actually not. Mm. Everyone gets angry from for different reasons. It's not, you know, we kind of become self-righteous. It's my anger. It's we 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 adopt anger as a characteristics, as an embodiment mm. of ourselves. And then, you know, and then or we do that to someone else, right? We make them as if they're permanent. You know, that's mm. such such an anger. We have one encounter with someone mm. and their reaction and their behavior is part of a context. Something made them react in that way. So I've seen them in this linear vision on that particular day. Certain causes and conditions cause them to react in that way that I associated and identified as anger. Mm. And I went, this is an angry person. Mm. And or or, or went, any kind of a emotion or reaction. Or, exactly. yes. yeah. or, you know, emotional mm. person or happy person, whatever. Mm. And mm. the next time I actually react to the person on the basis of that judgment I made. All right. Of Absolutely. And, and we yeah. tend to do that, you know, oh, here's that angry man again. Or we tell everyone else about that person being angry. And, you know, if we look at Putin, for example, I know my Buddhist teacher always uses Putin and he goes, you know, he causes a lot of suffering, but that's because he's suffering as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And he's working from his own set of stories and his own set of things that he believes in and things that are important to him and all that. Yep. Yep. Yes. And so for me, every difficult person, you know, no matter what it is, is is has a story. And can I, I think, you know, I, I, I don't know why it's coming to my mind now in South Africa, the uh, in Isi Zulu, in the, the Zulu community, they have a greeting. Um, but more than the greeting, um, when when you know more than the greeting, the response you know often and actually it's in Zimbabwe, the when someone asks you, "How are you today?" the response is, "You know, I'm well." You know, I would say if someone asks me, "How are you?" I go, "I am well," and they go. Uh, if you well, I am well, because mm. <laughs> it's the relationship that what I do has an impact on someone else. My mm. anger has an impact on someone else who may react in a particular way and causes that chain reaction. Mm. But in mm. Isis Lulu, which again is very similar to the Buddhist concept, there is something called Ubuntu. I am because you are. Mm. I am human because you human, because we human. Our humanity my humanity is defined by the humanity in which I live in. Yeah. And so the greeting, um, Saubona, means I see you. 
And on multiple levels, it is, I see you here as a, as a human being. I see you and the history that you come from. I mm. see you in terms of a person of the universe. <coughs> and the response is Sikona, which is, I have been seen. Mm. And it's such a beautiful way because in a way we walk through life and do we really see someone else? Absolutely. We, we, we often don't exactly. You know, mm. and the same way when we walk through the street and we see a homeless person, do we see that homeless person? Do we see the homeless person that's asking for money on, the, on what basis? As a person, as someone who is wasting my time, mm. or we wait when we and if we want to create a good impression, look how generous I am because we're walking with a whole group mm -hmm. of friends. You know, I will take out. You know, do we take out five pounds and say, "Oh, here you go. Here's five pounds." Mm. You know what? You know because we need to make others. You know what is my intention in giving What's that? What's your intention? Time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because for me, if my intention is to have you know, that act of generosity is already polluted if my intention is to make and elevate myself to mm. look good. It's ego-driven. But can so, we see the other person as mm. giving us the opportunity in that time to practice our generosity? Can we see it as an opportunity for us to learn? You know, here's someone, let me, you know, can I wholeheartedly see them? And is it yeah. just money that they want? Do I see them? Can I have their story? Can I see them? And if I'm giving them the money, can I give it to them with no strings attached, with no mm -hmm. obligation, whether they use it for drugs or coffee, etc. doesn't really matter because yeah. I don't know the story as to why they are going to go and buy alcohol or why, you know, how difficult it is to, 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 to go through their life. I don't know. Mm. 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 Yeah. I mean, that's, again, that's a very, very powerful, I mean, it's a, thank you so much for bringing that. Um, Cause I think the, the, you say, I see you on a level of, I see you as a human, I see you with your stories and your background and history, and I see you as a being part of this whole, being part of this one universe that we live in. And I wonder if, you know, if, if we were able to do that with all the people we find difficult in our life, how that would so, so change our way of being. You know, if that person in the office who comes along and says, you know, like uh, frustrates us or annoys us, like to be able to look at that person and just say, I see you, you know, and that you you can't react in the same way when you really do see someone like that or likewise with any other person in life. I think it's important, but first, before we can see them, we need to know a little bit about ourselves. And that's why I think going to, to be able to do that, we have to develop our capacity to look at ourselves, mm. to look at our own stories, to look at our own activations, because we all like to be seen as only having good qualities. But the reality is we all have wholesome and unwholesome qualities. Mm. And we all activated by certain things. Mm. And it's about understanding that and having compassion for ourselves that we can actually then start um, exercising it on others. And mm. for me, it's also, you know, and this is why I like a lot of the Buddhist meditation is, and in particular, Thich Nhat Hanh walks us through, can we see the person as a child? And I know um, in psychotherapy, we also go through the process of trying to look at things from different angles, from different perspectives, because if we're able to do that, to look at things from different perspectives, we realize that, you know, as long as we see if we have blinkers on, we're going to see everything with those blinkers. Yeah. The story that we have is the story that we will see. Yeah. And to see something else, we have to understand our story, why we're seeing it that way, but also see it from different angles. I mean, you may see a, a tree. I might see a baobab tree. You know, you could, may call it a leaf and I may call it a bud. You know, mm. it, we can understand that. Then I think we'll have a little more patience mm. but the reality of it is we don't live in that world and you know and we may never live in that world because it to, for us to live in a world where we can all see one another you know really see one another requires us all to cultivate mm. 
something. But it, it just takes one person to start that cultivation. And then if someone else does it, then it changes a little bit more and a little bit exactly. more, and then maybe we'll yeah. get that. Yeah, yeah. But I think when we say difficult people, I think for me, it's easy to react and see, oh, yeah, I'm learning something from this person because I think we often told they are a mirror image of ourselves, right? We are most activated by people who may be demonstrating some kind of behaviors that, we do. Yeah. Um, I think for us, for me, I think the difficulty is really looking at people that don't cause any action or reaction at all. Because we go through life so often being totally oblivious. We have either a pleasant feeling towards someone because they make us feel good or for whatever reason. You know, I mean, we, there could be no reason we could walk in the street and for some yeah. reason someone yep. activates us in some way. They We don't know them, but we either think, oh, I like you, sure. or, you or whatever. <laughs> but I think we have a whole lot of people that we're just indifferent to. And mm. I think that for me is important. And that's what I'm looking at now, because actually that's a difficult, that's a difficulty. What is it that's actually making me, why are they neutral in a way? Mm. Why, why am I indifferent to them? What is mm. it? Is it because they, what? You know, are they so oblivious? Why am I not seeing them as a person? And I think that yeah. that is for me is is my challenge. Mm. Or my challenging mm. situation, if you want to use it that way. That's so interesting. Yeah. I, w I wonder if perhaps that's a really good place to end with that kind of, that um, invitation, I suppose, to go away and, and explore all the people in our lives that we're indifferent to, that we're neutral towards. Why Why do we not see them? <laughs> lovely yeah yes yeah okay well thank you so much i mean it's been wonderful talking and and for you to bring all your wisdom and your experience and uh and to talk talk through this stuff if you've enjoyed this podcast please leave a review and a star rating on whatever platform you use and do recommend it to others because we all meet difficult people and each of those meetings presents an opportunity for learning and growth. I also have a downloadable video course in how to deal with difficult people. Head over to my website for more information, markwestmaquette.co.uk. Thanks for listening. <laughs>